I'd like to welcome you uh, to this workshop. Um, good evening. My name is Judith Tumusine. I am the Community Preservation Act Manager for the City of Somerville, and I'll be speaking about the CPA fund pre-application process. Uh, this workshop is specifically for uh, community organizations and individuals who may have ideas on projects uh, under the city that would be eligible for CPA funding. I will introduce the CPA and then get into what the application process looks like. So the CPA or the Community Preservation Act is a Massachusetts law, which has so far been adopted by 176 communities. And this law allows these communities, including the city of Somerville, to create a fund uh, for grant making. The law says that these funds can go to support uh, four categories, the open space uh, category, affordable housing, historic resources, and recreation land. But under the recreation land, it can only support the outdoor uh, recreation land uh, project. This funding comes from three sources, uh, the surcharge on the real estate property tax, and can be between 1.5 to 3%. And in the city of Somerville, the surcharge is 1.5%. Uh, these funds are matched each year by the state, and we are a blended community, so the city can put in an optional additional appropriation uh, of funds. <coughs> so um, this fund, the law uh, is very specific on what we can do and cannot do with these funds and in each of the four categories so we can use it to acquire new community housing we can create uh, community housing preserve it and protect it from harm and affordable housing is the only category where we can support uh, we can rehabilitate or renovate affordable housing but only if it was acquired or created with uh, cpa funds for the historic preservation we can acquire historic res resources preserve and rehabilitate this is the only category that we can't create um, historic resources of course because it requires time for you know um, an object to be historic. So in the open space category, we can use funds, acquire new open spaces, as well as in the outdoor recreation category. Uh, the difference between the two categories is that is in the de definition, which is in the legislation. Uh, open space is mostly about wildlands, and recreation land is about parks, uh, playgrounds and uh, community gardens. Uh, we can create recreation land and open spaces. We can preserve and rehabilitate if acquired or you know created with the CPA funds. One thing to note is that these the CPA funds cannot be used for maintenance or to replace the current spending, and the first thing that the committee looks at is the need to uh, you know, work with new projects to make sure that they fit within one of these categories and make sure that it's eligible for the CPA funding. So uh, every year, the Community Preservation Committee sets minimum funding allocations for each category. Um, they are having uh, the hearing this evening after the workshop where they will start, you know, taking in public comment on what should be included in the next fiscal year funding. But uh, if you can see for the FY20 uh, for this year, 
So the committee allocated 20% to open space, 15% uh, to the historic preservation, and 50% to affordable housing, as well as 10% to the flexible funding. Uh, the flexible funding is the only fund that can be used for the three uh, eligible categories of open space, affordable housing, and uh, historic. Uh, having flexible funding allows the Community Preservation Committee to respond to change in demand. For instance, uh, in one year, uh, we, will have, we may have a lot of application in the open space category and a few in the historic category. And so this gives the Community Preservation Committee the flexibility to respond to change in demand. So up to 5% can go to administration of the program. And this is, uh, these funds are utilized for, um, you know, expenses around public meeting, uh, my salary, consultancies, and you know, the state requires that we have at least a 10% minimum in each of these categories. So for the FY21, we estimate that we'll have uh, just over $1.6 million available. And if we are, uh, you know, it's, it's to be distributed over uh, the 10% minimum, that means that for each category, uh, we'll be receiving about 164,000. But most likely, we'll see that these minimums may change for each category because, uh, you know, over the years, the Community Preservation Committee has increased um, the allocations in all the three uh, categories. So uh, this just shows the kind of timetable uh, for the FY app application process, but also uh, the dates have been put in red because they are likely to change because of the current uh, COVID-19 you know, situation that we are in. So uh, those are, you know, would be like kind of tentative dates, uh, but these are the dates that we would have followed if uh, we did not have this crisis. So I'll give you, I'll give an overview and then I'll dig a little deeper into the next steps. Uh, so the first step is for the community members applying for projects on city land. Uh, so they submit a pre-application form, which is due um, Wednesday, May 20th. And if the city decides to sign on as a co-applicant, the next step would be to submit the eligibility determination form, uh, which is pretty much the same form, but will be revised based on changes agreed upon between the community applicant and the city department. All the projects determined to be eligible will be invited to submit a full proposal, which is usually due um, mid-September. Uh, so then the Community Preservation Committee starts the evaluation of these applications and starts to gather you know, public input. And usually a workshop is held where the committee receives public input after you know, the applicants have made a presentation of their uh, project. And it's anticipated that you know, around December, the committee votes on the funding recommendation. Uh, the, Community Preservation Committee gives these recommendations to the City Council, which makes the final vote, which may be between uh, December and January. And then uh, funds are released in the late winter, uh, of, uh, will be released in the late winter of 2021. So I'll just go through uh, now deeply into the pre-application process. So, there are two cases where you may have or need to submit a pre-application. The first one is when you are a community member and want to propose a project on city land. So the reason we do this is so that the relevant city department can weigh in and help shape the project. 
We ask this so that when the full application process starts, the community members and the city you know, can develop these projects as partners. Uh, if uh, you have an idea for a visibility study project, but you're totally not sure, you can use you know, some experts to think through whether or not it's a good project, which would be very, or, or whether it would be successful. And you can apply for these funds through the pre-application process. So um, if you're applying for a project on city land, there is a two page form that you can submit. The process involves uh, sharing this form with the relevant city department. They usually will review the application and they can decide on one of the four things. So the first one, they can decide to sign as a co-applicant. And once they do this, you can move forward with the eligibility determination phase. The second one uh, is they can propose that you develop ideas for later submission, maybe because they don't have the staff capacity to do this this year, but may be uh, available the next physical year, which might be a better timing. And the third is if it requires participation in already an existing project, or you have an idea that is already you know, being developed, they may decide that they are not going to second that project. And at that point, the, applica the application process may stop for that fiscal year. So um, if you'd like to apply for a feasibility study, the first step is to work with me as your CPA manager, and I will work to find a neutral expert who will be able to provide analysis of the proposed project to determine how to increase the likelihood of the project success through you know, public processes, could be surveys on land or communities, you know, could try to do costing to determine if it could be done for a reasonable amount of money, and you know, to get technical advice about the project. We could also try to have you know, these be neutral projects to give the applicant the best chance to be able to succeed by looking at the realities of the project and you know, through engaging a third party uh, who is the expert. If you accepted and the city decides to be a co-applicant, then you can enter the full application uh, process. So um, for the next uh, phase really is to, you know, looking at now the funding decisions within the application you know, process, which are lengthy process as we've gone through. But the first final step is for the Community Preservation Committee to make funding recommendations to the city council. And uh, the funding recommendations are made by a nine member Community Preservation Committee. So they are five positions that are designated from relevant commissions, like the Housing Authority, the Planning Commission, Historic Preservation, Conservation Commission, and the Department of Public Space and Urban Forestry. And there are four at-large members, and all these you know, work together to recommend funding to the City Council. Um, Usually the decisions about these projects are also made through an annual community preservation plan, which sets priorities for a given year. Uh, of course, this is an annual process, but emergency funds uh, or funding is possible, although this has to be really, there has to be an, an urgent need for this funding. The CPC reviews uh, all the applicants or applications in the open space, uh, non recreation, and historic preservation categories. Uh, whereas the affordable housing funds are managed by the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which is the housing arm of the CPC. So the trust makes the grant decisions you know, for the housing uh, projects. 
In each of these uh, projects, the CPC uh, is looking uh, for if the project is eligible to receive CPA funding. And that is the main question they consider in the eligibility determination phase. Once they get to the full uh, application phase, they look at if the project involves all the necessary groups, uh, whether, you know, it could be within city departments, but also within the communities. Uh, you know, they try to make sure that, you know, or we'll find out that stakeholders are aware, will support the project, and uh, whether the project will benefit some of your residents, and how well this project match the community preservation plan priorities, and whether, you know, the project uh, is a you know good use of uh, public resources so uh the first phase like mentioned earlier is the eligibility determination phase they are key things you need to have in place you need to have the ability to receive funds you are either a 501c3 or the property owner if you are not one of those things, you need to have a co-applicant who will take on that fiscal role. You need to have permission from the owner or private property or as a co-applicant or public property, whether it is the city or state. And if you're applying for a historic fund, there need to be a determination or historic significance if the building is already on the national register or local district that is you know, sufficient. And if it's none of those, then you need to seek determination from the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, I'm sure Sarah White might be um, here with us. Sarah, if you're here, would you like to say something about the, the expectations of the historic projects? Sure, um, it, as, as regards, um, uh, determination uh, as to whether or not it's historically significant or just in general? So in general, sure. And, and you know, looking, because, you know, we are now discussing kind of things we look out for, you know, the, the, the applicants for funds projects in the historic, you know, category. Sure. So for those who are, my name is Sarah White. I'm the, I'm a city planner and I'm a preservation planner for the city of Somerville. I'm also the liaison to the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, and I work very closely with Judith on CPA projects. Um, I was also on the CPA committee in my own um, community and chaired the historical commission there. So um, my experience is both professional as well as personal. Um, so when it comes to applying for a historic preservation project, if you don't have a building um, that is um, uh, a local historic district or is on the National Register, you need to come into the Historic Preservation Commission to have them determine whether or not they feel the building is historically significant um, because it's, it's historically significant artifacts um, and buildings and the like um, that can possibly qualify for uh, CPA historic preservation funds. Um, and now note what I also said, which is it's not just a building, it's also artifacts. Um, we have had CPA applications come in for historic preservation funds that involve the restoration um, and scanning of historic voter records, um, the restoration of a bas relief at the Central Library. So these are clearly not buildings, um, but these are also um, items that need to be determined um, to be historically important by the Historic Preservation Commission. When um, you do receive um, historic preservation funds from the CPA, when it comes to buildings, you will need to follow the Secretary of the Interior standards, um, the Secretary of the Interior standards um, for rehabilitation and restoration of historic properties. Um, and if you're in a local historic district, you will have to comply with those local historic district guidelines as well. I am very available um, for anybody who ever has any questions about what it means to follow these guidelines, um, how they're implemented, and how you should prepare and pro 
and um, propose your um, project to the Historic Preservation Commission. And I can walk you through all those steps um, every step of the way and tell you what those local historic district guidelines mean and what those National Register um, of Historic Places Secretary of the Interior standards mean um, for your project. And by working in conjunction with Judith, I can also help you refine your project um, so that you are, are taking on a, a project that is both feasible, um, hopefully um, fundable and executable um, on your end. One of the other things that's very, very important is that um, you will be required um, when you come in for um, a historic preservation money on a building, you will be required to enter into what's called a preservation restriction. And this is a uh, restriction in perpetuity on the entire exterior envelope of your building. Um, and this is part of protecting the public money and the public interest, um, as this is public taxpayer money that is going to um, oftentimes private entities um, and nonprofit organizations. Um, it's very important that, that we fulfill our fiduciary responsibilities and um, ensure that that investment that the public has made is protected in perpetuity. And so at this point, we also require that that preservation restriction is entered into and executed prior to your um, receiving of historic preservation funds from the CPA. Um, unless there's like a really, really, really extenuating circumstance, and then that we would work through on an individual basis. Um, and how you come up, what we'd be looking for in a preservation restriction, um, we work with our, our legal counsel on that. Um, and then our legal counsel also works with Judith and I so that um, they can get our perspective as well. And um, we'll make sure that we meet with you to ensure that you understand what the provisions of that restriction um, actually mean and actually are obligating you to. Um, but I'm fully available at any time for any um, further questions um, and guidance in this matter. Yes, so thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate that. Um, sure. Before that, Louisa, would you like to make any comments? Would I like to make what, Judith? Sorry? Like, like is there anything that you'd like to, you know, inform um, the potential applicant, like in terms of the expectation for open space, like the restriction? Sure. So my name is Louisa Oliveira, and I am the Director of Public Space and Urban Forestry. And I'm also on the committee. We uh, get a number of applications every year for open space. People have a lot of ideas and are very passionate about open space in Somerville. And um, usually, as Judith said, if they are on city land, then they have to get approval from our department. So that's important. And the reason we do that is one, to understand that it's possible and two, um, to work with the community so that we're supporting projects that are in line with the goals and the needs of our community. The best place to see the goals and needs in terms of open space are in the open space plan, which is online. It's called the open space and recreation plan. If you just Google open space and recreation plan, you'll see that it's there. And there are a number of other supplemental documents that help with that, um, including a fields master plan and um, an acquisition memo that was uh, written by a group working on um, strategies for how to acquire more open space. So clearly the acquisition of more open space, because we are so densely populated, is a, a big goal for us. Um, unfortunately, land is incredibly expensive um, at over $2 million an acre. That's always a real challenge. The CPA has responded in the past by putting um, a fund together to put money into so that it's a little bit more nimble in terms of acquiring open space, but it is always a challenge. So I would say that that's really the number one goal is to increase our open space um, acreage, which is also was identified in the summer vision uh, process. And then uh, we also have shortages for community gardens. People are always uh, looking to add community gardens. That's something that is we hear frequently. Um, the community gardens is the purview of the Conservation Commission, so they oversee that. And there are no term limits, so it's very hard to get into a community garden. So we're always hearing from folks that they would like more community gardens. And the third thing that we see a real need for is athletic fields. Um, some of you may know there's a lot of 
conversation in the community about athletic fields, but we are not able to meet our present athletic field need uh, for, for just the athletes, the youth athletes at Somerville in the school. So those are kind of the overall three uh, primary needs of open space. Again, I encourage you to have a base plan and um, to work with us, especially if you're proposing something on uh, land that's owned by Somerville so that we can have a good understanding of if it's something possible, if it's something needed, and if it's something that we will support. Uh, we never seem to have a shortage of open space projects. So uh, it's really important and beneficial that the CPA continue to fund open space since uh, it's something that our community is always crying for and obviously we, we uh, all want it as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Louisa, uh, for that good uh, contribution. So we, we just have, you know, under uh, four minutes. So uh, I'll just quickly go through. Uh, so for the full application, um, these are the last applications that you need to develop for the projects that are joined between the community members and the city. There will be a discussion on how you want to submit the projects, like Louisa and Sarah have said. You may you so you have uh, to submit a complete narrative and budget, maps, photos, and all documentation of uh, ownership and certificates of good understanding, letters of support, and you know submitting any applicable reports that you may have done including the line phase if it's a construction project, and also must you know submit a mandatory financial disclosure form. Um, so uh, we, I think uh, Sarah briefly went through uh, the needs for the historic. Uh, we have just um, about three minutes uh, to the next uh, event, which is the main uh, public hearing. But if you have any questions about this whole process, you kindly you know contact me. That's my email. And that's my phone number, and I will also share details of Sarah and, and Louisa if you would like to, you know, ask them more questions regarding uh, the, the different uh, projects in the different categories. So thank you so much for your time and for, you know, participating in this workshop. I think we will now switch to the uh, public hearing. Well, well, it's seven o'clock, so why don't we get started? Uh, my name is Jane Carbone. I'm the chair of the Community Preservation Committee, and tonight uh, we're having an open meeting. This is a virtual public hearing for the Somerville FY21 Community Preservation Plan. Today is April 22nd, 2020, at seven o'clock, and this meeting is a go to public meeting due to COVID 19. First, um, I'm going to briefly talk about sort of the structure of the meeting. We're going to, I'm going to introduce uh, the committee members and the uh, co-chair, and then uh, Judith is going to do, uh, I'll do a little welcome and uh, welcome and introduction, uh, and then Judith is going to talk briefly about the draft preservation plan for 2020, for 2021, and then we're going to have uh, invited members to present testimony of uh, different groups in Somerville that have either participated or are aware of the community preservation plan in the past. And then we're gonna invite public testimony at the uh, end. For the first uh, invited testimony, we're allowing five minutes to speak and then briefly ask questions. Laura is gonna be the co-chair, is gonna be the timekeeper of the uh, presentation so that we don't run over. And then the public testimony is going to take um, two minutes each for if public or want to testimony want to um, say anything. Their time slot is two minutes each. And if you want to speak, uh, we have, there's a chat room that you can enter your name in or uh, just notify us that you want to speak. And Judith is going to be following um, that chat room to see who wants to speak at the end during the public testimony time. So first, I just want to do a roll call of um, committee members. 
uh, Vice Chair Laura Boreski. Here. Luisa Oliveira. Here. Are you on? Uh, Tatiana Shannon. Here. Amelia Aboff. Here. Eleanor Rances. Here. Heather Highmark. Here. Christina Kennedy. Here. Caitlin Hart. Here. And uh, staff to the Community Preservation Committee, Judith to Massimi. Yeah, here. Great. Um, so my just a few remarks. Um, I wanted to first talk a little bit about COVID. You know, the COVID-19 poses quite a threat and to our community and it's unprecedented and just wanted to take a, a moment to recognize all the lives that have been lost during this COVID crisis. And I would also like us to appreciate the hard work and sacrifice of all those who are working to save lives and keep us all safe. And we can't thank them enough for rising to that challenge. I, I also know how challenging it is to work in such an uncertain environment, but I would like to thank everyone here for taking the time off to participate in this community preservation plan hearing. As I stated earlier, this hearing is being held virtually on the GoToMeeting platform in compliance with Governor Baker's emergency orders regarding the open meeting law during the COVID-19 crisis. In FY20, the CPC has continued its support of affordable housing in coordination with the Sonoma Affordable Housing Trust. The trust has awarded funds to five affordable housing programs that include affordable rental housing, rental assistance, housing stability assistance, and housing for victims of domestic violence. To date, the CPC has awarded funds for 90 new units of permanently deeded restriction affordable housing. CPC has also recognized the importance of health and recreation benefits that open space provide and awarded funds for open space projects, as well as recognizing the importance of the history of the city for historic preservation projects. We're excited about the work we have done in FY20 and are looking forward to seeing what a great ideas the community puts forward for projects in FY21. Our community now more than ever needs more support to provide critical housing needs, create healthy open space, and preserve the fabric of our community to historic treasures. The situation is fluid and the CPC priorities for FY21 may shift, and that is why your testimonies and ideas during this hearing are very important to us. We are thankful to all of you that have made the time to participate in this hearing. The CPC committee encourages you to share your ideas with us on how the city should prioritize spending for FY21 Community Preservation Act funding. At, as a committee, as a committee, we want to extend your ideas. We want to extend our best wishes to everyone during this health crisis, and please stay safe. And at the end of the hearing, um, Judith is going to post uh, the what we'd like to do in the chat room is have people vote on their priorities, and also uh, there's a, a her email and any comments to be given on priorities for this year um, up until May 15th. So now I would like to have Judith do her uh, presentation on the draft uh, plan. You're on mute, Judith. Thank you very much, Jane. And once again, you're welcome. Uh, my name is Judith Tumusime, the Community Preservation Act Manager. And I'm sure some of you know already about the CPA, but some may have joined to learn about uh, the CPA. So um, I'll begin by giving a general overview of the CPA, which is the Community Preservation Act, the Massachusetts specific law. And so far, 176 communities, about half the municipalities have adopted it. And when a community adopts this law, it allows uh, the community to create a fund for grant making uh, from three sources, the surcharge and property tax, uh, which is between 1.5 and you know 3 percent, but the city of Somerville adopted the 1.5 percent surcharge, which is matched by the state, and we are a blended community, so the city can put in some money, which is an optional decision that they make each year. The Community Preservation Act Fund can be used for the four categories of open space, affordable housing, historic preservation, and uh, outdoor. Uh, uh, recreation land projects. 
So the Act tells us what we can use and cannot use the Community Preservation Act funding for. Uh, there's a summary, um, you know, what we can use it for, and we can use it to acquire new open space and recreation land. And the difference between the two in the Community Preservation Act language is that open space is a wild land, and conservation land is, you know, uh, conservation land, wetland, but we don't have a lot of that in Somerville, given that um, how built the city is. But we have a lot of outdoor recreation land, and these are parks, playgrounds, and community gardens. And you can see that the you know funding for both is usually put in one part. And for the historic and affordable housing, uh, each their own category. So the Somerville um, Affordable Housing Trust Fund serves as a housing arm for the Community Preservation Committee. We can create new housing, new open space, and recreation land, but we can't create historic resources, obviously, because we can't wait for something to become historic. Uh, we can also do preserve preservation works across uh, all these categories, and we can only support uh, in the housing category, and the support means, you know, kind of programming like rental assistance and other programs that my colleague, Heidi, uh, will talk about shortly. We can also rehabilitate and restore across the categories, but in the open space and affordable housing category, we can only use these funds for, you know, the object that was created using this Community Preservation Act fund. So the funds can also not be used uh, for maintenance and to replace current uh, expenditure. Uh, the, the state law tells each community that you have to put at least 10% of the funding in each category. So each year, since we started developing the community preservation plan in Somerville, the CPC opted to set higher minimums for each category. Last year, the allocations were 20% for open space and recreation, 15% for historic preservation, and 50% for affordable housing, as well as 10% for flexible. So for the flexible funding, can only go for eligible projects in the three categories. What happens is that you know, in some years, you'll see a lot of open space projects and not a lot of historic. And the next year is the opposite. So the flexible funding gives the Community Preservation Committee some room to respond to changes in demand from year to year. We can spend up to uh, only 5% on administration or operating expenses, and um, you know, which include consultancies, my salary, and, and, and meeting needs. So uh, the Community Preservation Committee really takes community feedback very seriously and recognizes that everybody is able to join the public, <coughs> recognizes that not everybody is able to join the public hearing. So we go out to the streets every year and through the summer street and also festivals and events where we put out, you know, these very beautiful jars and ask, give, you know, 10 pom-poms and ask, uh, the public to allocate them, you know, across the four categories. So to speak to all those people who participated over the summer, the allocations we are seeing are pretty consistent across the years. So the last year, people thought 40% should go to affordable housing, 18% to historic resources, 32% to open space and recreation, and 10% to flexible. And we will still carry out this uh, exercise during this hearing and hopefully, you know, we can all join and participate. So for our coming uh, fiscal year 2021, we are anticipating that there will be a little over $1.6 million available for all the three categories. So the CP, the Community Preservation Committee opted to do just, if the Community Preservation committee opted to do just 10% minimum and put the rest in flexible funding, then we'll have, you know, a minimum of about 164,000 uh, for each category. And if you see how funds have been distributed across the three categories within the, uh, you know, without bonding, like the chart shows to date, 42% of funding has gone to affordable housing, 28% has gone to historic, 30% to open space and uh, recreation land. And the reason you're seeing the differences is because of 
where the flexible fundings go. I also wanted to mention that the bonds for uh, 100 homes was issued and we started paying the debt service this year. And uh, we shall also start paying the debt service for the West Branch Library uh, next fiscal year. I'm going to go quickly through the priorities. And if you have ideas of what should be included in these priorities, please write them down in the chat, or you can send them to me by email that I'll share at the end of the presentation. So there are two overall priorities that the Community Preservation Committee sets. And the first is the is projects that are consistent with the community values. And you know, they include, you know, the improvement of accessibility, incorporating sustainable practices, receiving, you know, a endorsement from other Somerville uh, boards, commissions, and departments, and also should be consistent with the goals and priorities that are established in the current planning documents, and should be able to address at least two or more of the CPA focus areas. And, uh, you know, of course, also support some of your diversity, including, you know, support to immigrants, regardless of the status. The second one is, you know, projects should use CPA funding strategically, you know, you know leverage other funds or in-kind contribution to implement cost-saving measures, address long-standing or urgent needs of the community, and take advantage of exceptional type sensitive opportunities and also could serve as a catalyst. So for all these, the priorities are different for the different categories, and we have details of this also in the uh, community preservation plan, which is online. I will not go through all of them because of the time. So the same with uh, housing. So the priorities are all uh, listed. So if you have uh, anything that you'd like to uh, add, please. Uh, send your written comments to me. We are accepting them through May 15th. You can send them to me on my email. You can also share you know, your ideas by taking the community preservation survey, which is on our website. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judith. And now, um, just for those folks that have joined, I just wanted to say that this is a virtual public hearing for the Somerville FY21 Community Preservation Plan. And we just heard Judith speak about the draft plan. And now I want to welcome and uh, introduce our speakers from to give their invited testimony from various some of the groups. And the first uh, group I'd like to speak with from the city of Somerville Summer Vision 2040 is Melissa Woods. I'm sorry. So it's not Melissa this time. It is. Um... It is Victor. He will he will introduce himself. Sorry about that. Oh, hi. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Sorry. Oh, not can a problem. Say... Uh, I work with Melissa. Oh, Victor. Melissa. Okay, Victor. Um, I apologize. So Victor is going to speak about the Summer Summer Vision 2040 plan. <laughs> Thank you. Um. So quick introduction, I'm a uh, community outreach planner with the city's planning department, and I was part of the uh, staff team that worked in summer 2040, which is the update to the city of summer comprehensive plan. Uh, if someone could uh, start the slides there, or I could also share my screen. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so first thing, just to give everyone background, what is the, the summer vision 2040 comp plan? Basically, a comp plan is written in partnership with our community. We've, we had a committee of over 60 uh, members of the community, as well as hundreds of community members who gave us feedback in some shape or form. And the point of it is really to outline our broad goals and big ideas for the future, and, that, and also to clarify what our values are and make sure that those are aligned. Implementation strategies are a different process that comes after the, the, the comprehensive plan and the, the CPA plays a role in, in, in that implementation as well as many other departments and organizations. Um, the main reason why we updated it was a lot changed in the 10 years since the Summer Vision 2030 was written. But Summer Vision 2040 is new. It does bring in all the good ideas from Summer Vision 2030 and just updates them a little bit and then add some brand new ideas to the reflection channel. You can move slides. So 
there were two key overall teams that came out of the summer vision 2040 process displacement and equity so displacement we're talking about households being displaced at alarming rates because of high housing costs this also uh, applies to some small businesses and nonprofits uh, who also deal with commercial uh, displacement and we really uh, we really came to a conclusion that we, we we need to continuously assess how we can minimize and mitigate the displacement as a framework for every decision that we make in the city the second one was that we need to talk about how implementing our goals and utilizing our shared resources we need to consider how different segments of a community have different needs priorities and challenges that for folks who are facing imminent displacement or homelessness that their priorities are very different and also merge and then what other priorities might be and that we need to think about how some things we were doing that may be good for some sex parts of the city may not be good for others. You can move on. So there were eight chapters in Summer Vision 2040. I'm gonna to touch on four that I think are more relevant and I encourage everyone to take a look at the full plan. So housing uh, obviously is gonna be really key to the work the CPA does uh, as a consideration. Summer Vision 2040 established 20% of housing stock becoming affordable by 2040, which is a very ambitious goal. Uh, and it talked about establishing a task force to talk to uh, with the right resources and expertise to really figure out what what possible ways could we get there and to talk about zoning amendments uh, that could make it easier for affordable housing development both of those points can indirectly affect C uh, the, the, the cpa in terms of how you direct affordable housing money you can go to the next slide uh, climate and sustainability is obviously a huge concern right now. Uh, the plan establishes 80% decrease in carbon emissions by 2040 as a goal. I think when people talk about open space and the way in which open spaces can also function as resiliency features to deal with the consequences of climate change as well as educating people about how we need uh, to mitigate uh, carbon emissions, there can be some connection there. You can go to the next slide. Uh, public space and natural environment is again one of the key uh, issues that I know you look at with the CBA funding. Uh, the goal is 105 new acres by 2040. This is the same goal as 2030, just minus what has been done since. That's also a very ambitious goal, especially when you consider the land cost value. It's something that reflects more how we where we want to get. Um, but we are talking about creating a, a developing further developing acquisition strategies. We don't know how the impact on the economy of COVID-19 is going to impact uh, our capacity to acquire land or not. I think that's to see. Uh, but there's also a lot of conversations about safe routes to parks and considering not only do we have the open space, but also who can get to it and how easy it is for folks to get to it. Okay, uh, go okay. Um, excuse me, I, I, I'm, this is Laura. I'm timekeeper. I just wanted to let you know you have about 30 seconds left. Um, everybody gets five minutes. I'm not sure that Jane made that clear, but oh, um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, okay. Uh, youth and education. The main thing I want to bring up here is uh, we talked to a lot of teens from the city, and they talked a lot about the need for more recreational spaces for teens, both indoor and outdoor. Uh, so that's a consideration as well that that was one of the first top things that they named this thing they want to see in the city you can go to the next slide uh, that's the last slide uh those are just a few highlights from the other chapters that i don't need to get into uh if you go to the final slide now there is a website uh, summervision2040.com where all of this information is spelled out along with the full document and or how we get at that data. So I encourage anyone who wants to learn more today to go and take a look. Thank you very much. Thanks, Victor. That was a quick wrap, wrap up. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, the next speaker is uh, City of Sunwell Public Space and Urban Forestry Division, Courtney Kirk. Yes. Hello. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, as uh, I was introduced, I'm also the project manager for the Central Hill Campus Phase 1 design, which is a project that applied for CPA funds, and we are very appreciative of um, the funds that were awarded for this project. 
specifically, I want to focus in on the Central Hill Playground, um, which is how we're applying the funds um, to renovate the existing playground, which has been displaced because of the new high school building. So in the slide, you can see that the old location on the left um, was sort of in between the high school and the library. The new location will be moved to the, the front lawn area of the, the central library. Um, next slide. Uh, we see this as a great opportunity to um, upgrade the play opportunity and imagination building space capabilities for this new playground renovation project. Um, we, through community feedback, uh, we heard a lot of response that people would like the space to um, foster imagination around native environments and have build connections to the library. Next slide. Uh, we have a lot of uh, users that uh, of the Central Hill playground uh, that come from our local daycares, uh, such as Pooh and Friends and the Learning Circle that walk to the playground every day as part of their outdoor um, their outdoor learning and they also come to the library quite often uh, so we really worked uh, with feedback also from the the local daycares to ensure that we are uh, incorporating spaces for smaller children as well as older children next slide uh, we did some targeted outreach to our library patrons, uh, and they really wanted to ensure that there is space for our five to 12 year old age groups um, and that uh, there are uh, all age groups that use the library and this play space will only support um, more activity on Central Hill. Next slide. Uh, the uh, playground will also include elements for teenagers and additional reading locations um, and activities to support outdoor movie watching and uh, some of the programming that the Central Library uh, currently runs. Next slide. Uh, and we're also incorporating ideas that were brought to us from the library, such as a story walk. Um, where there will be an outdoor um, book that children and families can read as they walk around the outdoor spaces of the playground area. Um, and there will be facilities to have um, learning opportunities that aren't within the, in the enclosed area of the fencing. Next slide. So thank you all very much. Um, as I said before, the CPC funds, CPA funds uh, are critical for us to renovate some of our city park projects um, and also guarantee that these open spaces will be uh, open spaces in perpetuity. Um, and we really, really value the support and the funds for these projects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, the next speaker we have is from uh, is Lisa Brucolaccio from the Community Growth Center. Did I pronounce your last name right? Uh, Lisa, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, great. Okay. Um, thank you. And um, Judith, you can go to the next or whoever can go to the next slide. Thank you for inviting the Growing Center to be part of this conversation about how CPA funds can benefit the community. Um, I'm gonna skip through the first two slides rather quickly, um, just to say that specifically funding has been used um, for this space, which is was an early model for different ways of thinking about urban land use. Um, particularly how collaborations between the city government and local nonprofits and community agencies could activate 
um, green and public space. And it was rather unique initially that it was designed and built by local residents and maintained by volunteers. And it has been redesigned and renovated through significant community preservation support. Um, so next slide. So this is just a timeline that, um, oops, lost a number, that takes us from 1993 when the idea was first vetted to now, um, which has required some uh, significant community engagement. And um, after 20 years of a space that was built on a shoot string, um, an investment of um, funds to create a park that would last for another generation. Next slide. And this is just why was funding needed. Um, I mentioned the 20 years, was a 10 year plan initially. Um, the growing center, because it was unique, was not on the timeline for updating city parks. So the CTA um, was particularly critical for this space. Um, there was natural growth that happens and over time deteriorating hardscape created potential hazards. So we're going to move to the next slide. It's addressing. Um, again, there were three different phases, regenerative design, sort of pre preparation and formal plans, and then the restoration tab, which I would like to share with you in the last minute. Next slide. Um, so we spoke to the updating of aging infrastructure. In reality, this, if you have a, a site such as this with a 20 foot slope, you have to have retaining walls. And there's a lot of effort to make pathways um, to be ADA accessible and have universal access. Um, also, after many years, there were a number of invasives and the plantings were no longer ecologically integrated using sustainable um, practices. So trying to um, upgrade that slide. And so a few images of post renovation, just to let people know that there were changes. Um, so this is just sort of panoramic from the lower corner. Next slide. And this is some of the new native pollinator meadow planting. Mind you, this is after just one season. Um, children enjoying the garden areas. And this gets to equity. This is, we work very closely with Head Start to um, have kids come. And next slide. And having a place for all seasons, recognizing spending time outdoors in the winter is also critical and important. Next slide. Something we may have almost forgotten that we can gather for cultural <laughs> events. Hope to do so again. And this demonstrates some of the new pathways some of the new compost bins and uh, a diversity of enjoying the the diversity. And this is some uh, music from uh, yeah. just thank you to the CPA program for being able to help support green public recreational space for both current and future generations. As one of the things that we have found is that we have returning parents of young children who were students at the Growing Center when they were at Somerville schools in high school. And that's exactly, for me, part of why this work is so important, that we support future generations. Thank you so much, Lisa. The next speaker is uh, Rachel Borgatti from the Conservation Commission. Hi, everyone. I did not put together a uh, uh, PowerPoint or anything, so I'm just going to speak from my notes, but I appreciate this opportunity to speak, and it's really great um, remotely to see so many of you that I, you know, have really contributed to public space in the city of Somerville. Um, I wanted to start off thanking the city employees um, for all their hard work during this time to keep public spaces open and available. I know there have been over 900 signs printed and displayed in these public spaces and having personally sent emails to past 9 p.m. to city staff and still received a message. I, I appreciate that Somerville's public space and urban forestry staff are working hard to keep the city safe and accessible. Um, I also want to recognize that this meeting is occurring during 
unprecedented public health emergency and my own thoughts have changed even from when I first put together the outline for this exact public meeting only a month ago. Um, we have witnessed the eagerness of residents to enjoy the city's public spaces for health, recreation, in the case of the path and city's bike routes for transportation with public transport, public transportation is no longer feel safe. Um, I'm here tonight, so while I am the co-chair of Summer Vision um, 2040 and also a Somerville resident and parent, um, I'm here tonight to represent the city of Somerville's Conservation Commission, which I've served on for over seven years and have had the honor of being the chair for the last two years. Um, I'll paraphrase in the city's website in case you don't know what we do. Um, the, Summer Vis the Somerville Conservation Commission, or the CONCOM, is devoted to preserving and protecting Somerville's natural environment. Um, this, the CONCOM, um, administers and enforces the Wetlands Protection Act and the River Protection Act as an important role in open space planning. Um, now, almost every city and town in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has a conservation commission to regulate their wetlands and waterfront, but we also in Somerville have the pleasure of overseeing the city's community gardens. So the Community Preservation Act has been a great funding source for open space from supplying emergency funds to purchase um, a property at Glen Park next to Capuana Pool um, to, to also increasing the open, uh, to increase the open space in East Somerville, uh, to also renovating our schoolyards to be more aligned with open space principles and therefore more usable to not just that school, but the general public. Um, on the whole, this is an essential funding source that is relatively easily accessible to the community and city staff for open space and it's fantastic that we can access those type of funds to improve our city. Um, of course, <laughs> we have learned a lot since the CPA was adopted in November 2012 and there's still room for improvement. Um, the Conservation Commission has often not been consulted about projects that might need our assistance or require oversight um, before before those funds are awarded by the Community Preservation Committee. Um, the ComCom is eager to give input to projects like the Art Farm or those new, that new open space in Glen Park as early as possible before the projects are funded by the CPC, not to hold up projects, but to make the projects stronger and more aligned with other programs. And this would happen preferably before a request to, for a conservation easement or oversight for new community gardens are required. Um, so the other thing that I would like to recommend for um, the Community Preservation Committee is we have an encountered projects that um, are approved by the CPC if there's funds available that year. So if there's funds available and let's say open uh, excuse space. Excuse me, Rachel, you got 30 seconds or so to wrap it up, okay? Sure. Um, for ex um, so and, and that's whether uh, city staff have already completed previous projects. For example, schoolyard renovation design projects are are piled up. Uh, you know, while I understand it's politically like it's fair to have a variety of projects approved, unless there's the capacity to do those projects, I would uh, support the CPC considering either providing more funds to make sure those projects get funded before future projects get funded. So ensuring that the projects that are already funded get completed before additional funds are awarded, or even saying like um, apologizing essentially, I'm, part, I'm, I'm trying to wrap it up. So apologizing that, time. that, time. that, those, that those funds um, were already, that essentially until you complete the projects that were already awarded, that additional funds will not be awarded. Um, Thank you, Rachel. I, I, uh, I think your your comments are duly noted and we'll be discussing that at the next uh, CPC meeting. Appreciate your comments. We have the next speaker from the Somerville Museum, Barbara Magnum. 
And um, Jane, um, I'm sorry, I'm so, sorry. Can I interrupt for one second, Jane? Yeah. Sorry, it's really hard to hear some of the speakers. And I, I can, if I can ask again, if you're not on mute, please put yourself on mute because it creates a number, a lot of feedback, and we can't hear what the what the speaker is saying. Will I start? Yes, Barbara. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> So yes, I'm Barbara Mangum, and I'm the president of the board of the Somerville Museum. And I hope that you all have had a chance to get over to the museum and see some of the shows that we've had this past year before COVID-19 took over. Um, because there may be people who don't know the museum, I'm just gonna mention that uh, it was founded uh, as the Somerville Historical Society in 1897, and it began operating with a building and collections in 1930. Um, it's been operating continuously since that time, primarily with volunteers. Uh, the building is a handsome two-story federal-style building located at 1 Westwood Road in Somerville, and it's part of the Westwood Road Historic District. And that was the picture that you saw earlier. <clears throat> These are some of the pictures right now. Um, you, just, you can continue. Uh, we're just going to go through here about every uh, few seconds to give people a chance to read them, but to see what the museum's assets are for the community um, and what we try to do. So you see that we have the building, we had the Bullfinch Staircase from 1792, which is one of our treasures. You see collections of various types that are used as the basis of many programs. Uh, research is based on the assets of the museum, the library that it owns and these um, objects. This is someone who just, Nancy Luzigan Schultz, who just recently uh, came and gave a talk at the museum. You can go on. Uh, this is just the postcard from the last exhibition that we had that was, well, prior to the last, Faith in a City that Sharon Devro, Sharon Devro did. And uh, it was just an absolutely wonderful show. And I think it shows what the museum has to offer the community. This was um, Faith in a City. Um, and a religion in Somerville. You can continue. This is the exhibition that uh, was up until COVID-19 required the museum to shutter. You could go to the next one. And these are some of the other historic Somerville uh, up to now has been uh, a separate organization. It's probably going to join now with the museum, but it does historic lectures and research. You can continue more education with high school, and um, we do a lot with the high school these days. Performances, which are um, early music, we've got uh, over 25 years of performances with Dua Mauricienne. This is another performance that occurred at the museum um, from, again, a different exhibition. Um, and this is as we are now. So our main concern right now is becoming accessible. Um, here you see the stairs that people have to use right now to get into the museum. And this is the main entrance now, it's Westwood Road, if you continue. This is what it looks like from Westwood Road, when you continue. This is the museum as it's seen from Central Street, you know, in the heart of the city. And you can continue. And this is as we want to be. So this has been a long project to get to this point. Um, and the Community Preservation Committee last year gave uh, over 500,000 to the museum to get this elevator addition built. Um, the elevator addition, however, is a $1.6 million project. The museum has raised uh, funds up to the point of um, about 500,000. So we now need to, close that gap. I've applied to the Mass Cultural Facility Fund and I've asked them for basically all the money necessary to finish this project. Should they fully support the project, I'll be coming back to the Community uh, Preservation Committee with lots of wonderful projects um, in terms of, of uh, our, our collection care and all the needs that we need there. But likely we will not get that funding. Uh, we will if we're lucky, we'll get 50%. Uh, so we will still need about $250,000 to $300,000 just to get this thing built. 
Now we had started to, we were in the process of hiring a development director at the end of February. 32nd morning, Barbara. That's fine, I can finish it. Um, using funds donated for this pur purpose when we got COVID-19 pandemic uh, implications and fundraising uh, difficulties became apparent. So after a three month search for the right development consultant, the museum has had to reluctantly delay bringing him on board. The amount that we had targeted to raise from the late spring through summer and into the next fall was 300,000. Now the museum is seeking operational fund donations to keep the museum afloat. I'll just mention that we have a GoFundMe now campaign. So we are really looking um, at completing this project in 2021, if, we, if not before, if we can't start it in 2020. But this is such an important project and people have really been begging for this to be done for so long that we okay, are thank, thank you for help from the, from the CPC. Thank you Great. very much also for all you've done. Thank you, Barbara. Sure. We have uh, our next speaker, Mary Cassesso from the Somerville Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, Is Mary here? I don't see her name uh, as an attendee. So why don't we go on to the next speaker and Judith, you can see if, uh, if you could speak for the trust or we can have someone else speak um, for the trust. So uh, this is Heidi Burbage, and uh, Mary and I were both uh, scheduled to present. I think it's very possible that Mary had something come up. Um, she uh, has a lot of um, responsibilities at the Somerville Hospital, and um, I'm sure that's what's keeping her from being here. But luckily, we're uh, both uh, scheduled to present, and so um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Heidi Burbage and I'm a housing programs coordinator at the City of Somerville Housing Division. Part of my role there is to provide staff support to the Affordable Housing Trust. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this evening. In case you aren't already familiar with it, Somerville's Affordable Housing Trust has 30 years of experience preserving and creating affordable housing units and supporting programs to assist renters and homeowners. In 2014, Somerville's Community Preservation Committee designated the trust to administer CPA community housing funds. Next slide, please. So eligible or allowed uses for CPA housing funds, there are four, acquisition, creation, preservation, and support of affordable housing uh, that's affordable to households with incomes up to 100% of area median income. And by support, I mean programs such as rental assistance that make housing affordable. Next slide, please. This table shows how large the CPA appropriation for affordable housing uses has been each year since uh, 2015. And you'll see that in fiscal year uh, 2020, the housing appropriation totaled about 1,263,000 and 312,000 was used for debt service on the bond for the 100 homes program. Next slide. So how is this affordable housing funding distributed by the trust? Every year the trust issues two requests for proposals to solicit requests from affordable housing developers and nonprofit housing organizations. The uh, first RFP is for funding to create or preserve affordable units and the second is for programs such as rental assistance that make existing housing affordable. And with regard to the schedule for these housing RFPs this year, they will be issued in October 2020 with applications due at the end of the year and then awards made in January or February of 2021. Next slide. So to give you an idea of the funding that uh, the request that we might expect, let's look at the requests that were made in the previous year's RFPs. Uh, so uh, the uh, 31 Tufts 
is a city owned parcel and E3 development was selected through a separate request for proposals to develop the site. And uh, you see a little bit of the details about the affordable units. Um, the trust made an early commitment of $1 million of trust funds. This commitment can leverage other outside sources of funds, such as mass housing, workforce housing fund, and uh, DHCD community scale housing from the state. And so when the project budget is further developed, the trust in the city will determine what the distribution of city sources will be and how much of it would come from the CPA. And then if you look lower down in the lower table, it shows the amounts of CPA funds requested for housing programs and the amounts requested for each one. So um, let me just spell out the names for the agencies that applied for funding. SCC is the Somerville Community Corporation. SHC is the Somerville Homeless Coalition. CAF is Community Action Agency of Somerville. And Respond Inc. is a domestic violence shelter in Somerville. Uh, a total of 577,000 uh, uh, plus dollars of CPA funds for housing programs were requested in fiscal year 2020. So looking at all those programs, I'm just going to give a little bit more detail about each one. Um, so for the for, uh, next slide, uh, for the 100 Homes program, uh, the uh, trust support for 100 Homes is almost completely made possible through CPA funding. And the program's goal is to create 100 new affordable units through the acquisition and renovation of existing properties across Somerville neighborhoods. 53 rental apartments have been purchased to date since 2015. 90% of those are occupied now, and um, households must be income eligible uh, to reside in the affordable units. Of those 53 apartments. 30 seconds or so. Okay. Um, so there, uh, I think there's going to be somebody who may uh, speak more about 100 homes um, in the public comments. And I would really like to skip ahead to the other housing programs because as well as the needs for 100 homes, there's also other housing programs that received awards. So if you'll skip ahead to the next slide, uh, we're expecting that some of these programs are gonna have a really unprecedented demand, um, especially um, in the aftermath of the COVID-19. Uh, we do think it will um, be unprecedented. We're already starting to see an uptick that um, the uh, agencies that operate these programs are uh, receiving in terms of application. So you can quickly just sort of look through these programs um, that were listed in the table in a previous slide. Uh, they include uh, long, both short-term and longer-term rental assistance. Next slide. So, Actually, we're at 10, Betty. Pardon? You are 10, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Judith, do you want to just put up that last slide, Judith? The last slide shows the, uh, re the request versus the allocation, which shows that there was a lot more demand than we had money available for affordable housing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Hi. so much, Heidi. Can you hear me yet? This is Mary Cassesso. Hi, Mary. Oh, you're here. Okay. Well, I was I was here, but uh, with my um, mute button off, you weren't able to hear me, so I hung up and redialed. Sorry. Okay. Me. No worries. Um, well, welcome. And if you um, would like to say a few words, I will. You have, the, you have the floor. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Yes. First of all, I want to thank the committee, and I, I I I'm sorry not to be able to see all of you because it looks like this year the committee is all women membership. So um, congratulations, that's, that's wonderful. Um, and as Heidi said, um, so much more affordable housing has been enabled by um, um, the um, uh, CPC. And in fact, I worked on the Community Preservation Act to get it passed. Heidi mentioned that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is 30 years old. And in fact, I'm one of the original members. And it was by choice that I wanted to serve on this volunteer board because I think it's so important. 
I always say that I, I was born and raised in Somerville, a rare breed now, but I lived in what was uh, how we did affordable housing back then, which is if a family member was able to buy a, a, a two or three family, they usually let the apartments go to other family members at an affordable rate. And that's how my single mother with um, four kids was able to afford Somerville and why I'm so committed to affordable housing. I think the need is, is greater than ever. Um, over the past decade, I look at my own neighborhood now and none of the neighbors when I moved here are, are still here. But I, as, as Heidi mentioned, I do work at Cambridge Health Alliance and in particular Somerville Hospital by choice. And the um, issues of inequity around housing are affecting people so much in East Somerville right now with such a surge. I, um, I couldn't help but want to mention the impact of not having affordable housing, the overcrowding conditions, the situation where families are in a room of a small apartment um, in the spread that's resulting. So I'm not surprised we're seeing an increase in rental assistance. It's been always a disproportionate share of the most vulnerable, losing jobs, or worried about immigration status. So I think going forward, our battle, which was tough, as I said, for decades, becomes even tougher. So I just wanted to urge the committee to continue um, to support the needs and also underscore the pain and sorrow we're seeing. East Somerville being one of the, um, other than Chelsea, in summary there, I think East Somerville is, is up there with the issues on because of um, housing overcrowding. And um, in healthcare, we always talk about the social determinants of health. And the number one issue we hear from all of our patients is housing, the cost of housing. And I always say that Somerville has less and less diversity of people and socioeconomic diversity, et cetera, because it's getting impossible to be able to live here. So I thank you all. That was testimony more from the heart and more from what's been going on over the um, weeks around the clock of trying to care for people. I think these funds are more necessary than ever. Thank you for this opportunity to advocate. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Sarah White from the City of Somerville Historic Preservation Commission. Sarah? Hi, thanks very much. Um, so my name is Sarah White and I'm actually, um, I don't serve on the commission, but I actually am a preservation planner and a zoning case review planner for the city. So my presentation tonight comes um, at preservation from a slightly different angle, right? And it's from the planning um, angle and what we'd like to see um, and how I think that, that we can um, do some more interesting projects together that fulfill a lot of needs in the city. So quickly this summary, I'm gonna go over the types of projects that historic preservation can fund, protecting the public investment, upcoming implementations, and a wish list. I don't put goals, I put a wish list. Next page, please. Okay, so a lot of people think that historic preservation projects are just about buildings, right? We're only out to preserve buildings, and that is not the case. Um, there are all sorts of things that can qualify for historic preservation funds, and you see some of them here, and these are taken from the, um, the CPA Coalition's website. Um, we have the preservation and access of historic election records, the Somerville Museum, who you've um, uh, seen present earlier. We did some climate control work for them. Um, we have the preservation of a bas relief in the Somerville Central Library that was done during the uh, WPA years. And then we also have Mystic Waterworks. And this is a project I particularly like, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later because it's a blended project. Um, so here's an example. This is the bas relief for, um, uh, that's at the Central Library that was part of the uh, Works Progress Administration. Next slide, please. Restoration of grave markers at the Milk Grove Cemetery. It was built in 1804. You see a historic photo on the right, and then you see what it looks like today. It's been a multi-phase project that has um, restored the uh, grave markers in, um, in the cemetery. Next, please. 
You saw this before too, but the addition to the Somerville Museum to accommodate an elevator. On the right, you see what the museum looks like today. And on the left, you see the proposal that Barbara Mangum showed you earlier. Um, and this is to me ADA and Massachusetts Architectural Access Board accessibility requirements. And now Mystic Waterworks, this is what we call a blended project, right? It is more than one use of CPA money at a time. So this is historic preservation money that was used to preserve the building and restore it back um, to a certain period in time. And it also provided 25 units of affordable housing for seniors, and which is absolutely critical, as I know you've heard people talk about before. Um, but it is blended projects that as a planner, I am um, particularly interested in because we can solve multiple goals or we can look to reach multiple goals in summer vision and also um, deal with some um, some social inequities as well. So you see at the top, the uh, Waterworks building, um, you know, when it was in a bit of a poorer state and now you can see on the bottom um, restored, um, altered a little bit, and then you can see a portion of one of the units on the right. Next slide, please. Okay, so protecting the public investment. When we are talking about historic preservation funds being used for a structure, for the restoration work on a structure, it is our obligation um, as um, protectors of this money and distributors of this money to protect the public investment. And that is that public tax money that is going towards sometimes nonprofit organizations, but sometimes towards private homeowners too. So what is required? Um, you are required to enter into a preservation restriction. It is a legally binding document between you and the city. It is in perpetuity must be registered with the Registry of Deeds or recorded with the Registry of Deeds. It must cover the entire exterior envelope of the building, right? Um, any executed, any, any um, preservation restrictions must be executed and recorded prior to receiving CPA funds unless there's a really, really pressing emergency. Future changes to the building require compliance with the preservation restriction. It requires review and approval to make sure that those future changes are in accordance with the restriction. If we are going to expend money on a building, um, it is in the interest of the public that those changes remain, that they remain in good condition, and that other changes to the building then don't negatively impact um, what you've received CPA money for. Typically, these restrictions are held by the city unless it's for a city building, and then a city can't hold a preservation restriction on itself, and we must find an outside, um, an outside organization to hold it. Upcoming implementations. Sarah, finally, 30 seconds to wrap, wrap it up. I will do it. Local historic, okay. local historic District Property Owner Preservation Fund, uh, $150,000 we received a few years ago. We're now ready to start um, uh, getting the process in place to set up um, application process, review and approval, um, give up small grants up to $15,000 and do grant management through Judith. Next slide, please. Wish list. Outreach from CPC. I would really, really in love to see um, the encouragement of more HP-focused HP projects. I would like to see more of a diversity of the applicant and recipient pool. And part of that is doing um, more outreach and, and additional messaging. Encouraging more blended projects. Historic preservation is not exclusive. Historic preservation can, uh, can include affordable housing. It can include open space and recreation. Um, and I think that there is an opportunity if we look hard enough and work with the community enough to come up with these blended projects to do more than one thing at the same time. Um, and okay, lastly, cross-border cross collaboration, which is can we um, collaborate with bordering communities that have CPA like Medford? And that's it. Thank you, Sarah. That was a Thanks. great wrap up. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, our last speaker before the public testimony is uh, Kretchen Rolden from Elizabeth Peabody House. Good evening, my name is Kwecha Roldan. I'm the Executive Director at Elizabeth Peabody House. And with me, um, Katie Ausella, she's our Development Associate. Um, today we celebrate our 124th anniversary as a nonprofit agency. We were incorporated in April 22nd of 1896. Um, what we offer preschool, after school, uh, we also provide um, affordable child care um, and what one of the second most affordable child cares in the city of Somerville. We um, offer child care through subsidized assistance as well. Um, and we offer after school for eight, seven schools in Somerville. Next slide. 
Next slide. We also um, serve um, immigrants' family, low-income families. Um, we have a food pantry that we see about 80 families per week, and we are open. Currently, we opened two weeks uh, ago, um, and we're seeing more and more families in need of, of uh, groceries. Next slide. Um, this building was built as a Methodist church, um, and you can see that's a, a picture of 19, probably 1970s. Uh, we acquired this building in 1979. It acquired historical designation in October of 2017. Next slide. So one of the first projects that we did uh, was to do a full roof replacement you can see the before and after uh, with CPA uh, funds. And this really helped because the water was seeping through the walls, it was seeping through the ceilings, and it was causing a lot of damage to that building. The second project that we did was a comprehensive building assessment. Um, we needed to know what were the next steps uh, of, of of preservation of that building. Um, the people who are using that building are teachers, are social workers. We don't know much about engineer, architectural, and how to keep a, a, a building. So we um, hired this architectural firm and they established some priorities for us to work. As a result of that comprehensive building assessment in 2019, you can see that we change this was an aggressive stairs that would come from our after school program to exit in the playground and we completed this project um, not with the funds of uh, cpa with our own funds uh, but this october we completed this uh project and these are new brand new well in the fall we completed it um and so they are up to code and and they're safe now we have this other project in FY20. It's a fire addressable alarm system because that was also identified in the building assessment plan. And as a result of that, we are implementing everything that we can in that um, assessment. So we have the, we had to postpone the uh, implementation of this project because it was supposed to be um, done in late spring, early summer, but due to um, our pandemic, we might have to postpone it for later in the summer. Um, uh, we have the monies um, and we are hopeful that we're gonna uh, do that. Um, just so that you understand, this funding for us has been crucial because without this uh, without these funds we have not been we were not going to be able to preserve this building there was no way with uh, the the income that we have that we were going to preserve this building and this this funds have been imperative for us to preserve um, our building so we are very thankful very appreciative of these funds and and we hope that we can continue to preserve and and work on the priorities that the building assessment um established um last spring thank you thank you thank you Kreta. and that concludes our invited testimony now i'd like to uh ask if anybody has any questions before we open it up to public testimony and if there are anybody um, in the public that is going to be speaking, we are allotting two minutes to your uh, to your conversation, but also uh, put put yourself in the chat room so Judith can introduce you. And when before you speak, just state your name and your address. So they are also on the my screen. So if you look at the chat. Uh, I don't know whether Jen, you're able to see the name. So yeah, so Mark is the first presenter. The public. 
Hi, my name is Mark Alston Follinsby. I live in Waltham, but I work at CAST, the Community Action Agency, and oversee the program that disperses the CPA funds that we use to help people with their rent. Uh, we've had this fund now for almost a year. It, over the course of a year, we would see probably about one application a week. Uh, it started to pick up in January to the place to the point where by March it was about 10 applications a month. And so far this April, we've had uh, over 20 applications for these funds. Um, they're very important for the work that we do because we use them to keep people housed in Somerville and we use them to help people who are out of housing to get back into housing. Uh, I was on a, a uh, training today from CHAPA about CPA funds, and I learned something that I didn't know before, and that is that it, the CPA funds don't have to be used within our community. And I'd like to make two suggestions to the committee, please. One is that while we would wish for everybody to be able to stay in Somerville, the reality is that we're not able to find housing for everybody that needs it in Somerville. And if we could use these funds to help people move to nearby, wherever they have to go, that would be really beneficial to the the uh, people we work with um, and as well as the community. The other thing is that we have a cap of $3,000 per client. It's a lifetime cap. And I'd like to suggest that if you, you could expand that cap a bit, we would be able to more fully help each family with whatever they need to make sure that they stabilize. But again, thank you very much for the uh, grants that you give to the Affordable Housing Trust that they give to us. They're very important and we're grateful for it. Thank you for letting me speak this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the next speaker is Tori Antonino with the Green and Open Space Somerville. Hi, thank you for um, having me. Um, my name is Tori Antonino. Um, I live at 65 Boston Street. I'm a, um, from Green and Open Somerville. Um, we received a, a CPA uh, funded project in 2016. Um, it is a, um, a native meadow and um, it provides a bit of nature in the city that we have um, unfortunately landscaped in a very sort of sterile way. So my request to the Community Preservation Committee is that as we, um, have more open space and recreation projects, that we prioritize those who um, have an ecological restoration component in it. And it doesn't need to be, you know, we don't need to, it doesn't have to be huge swaths of land. Um, it can be just very simple integrating more um, in native plantings in our parks that we have. And when that happens, you will see uh, pretty much instantaneously wildlife returning to the city. And uh, I believe it is possible that we can coexist. And um, and so that is my one of my goals as a member of Green Open Somerville and as well as a volunteer with um, the Growing Center that has just a wonderful project um, and hopefully will be opening up soon so people can really enjoy it. The meadow is coming in, our insects are coming back. So with this time, and if you can give me a 30 second warning, that'd be great. Um, it is so important that we have access to nature, that everyone has access to nature. Morning. Thanks so much. Um, so that it's not just privileged people who have the ability to go to the fells that have this access, but that we just um, create the forest in our city. And I, I really feel like we have the um, capacity to do that. And I also just wanna mention um, food equity we need to have our community gardens be accessible to everybody and we need to in every little bit of space we have we need to make sure that everyone um is in walking distance of of fresh food so that is my request and thank you very much for your work thanks so much tori um and also thank the public just for the public testimony for just being here this evening for this meeting we really appreciate it uh, as a committee the next uh, speaker is brielle short Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Brielle Short and I'm the Director of Programs of the Somerville Homeless Coalition. Um, I'm actually a resident of Woburn, but um, through my involvement 
with the Somerville Homeless Coalition and as a trustee on the Somerville Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I wanted to come here tonight just to advocate for an increase in CPA funds for affordable housing. Uh, obviously, with the current crisis, it's become even more apparent how unaffordable housing is in Somerville. You know, right now, households from every income level are having trouble paying for rent and mortgage, um, which is the reality that low-income households face on a monthly basis um, and have been long before this virus. Um, although affordable housing projects that are supported by CPA funds benefit households with a broad range of incomes, I'd like to just speak a little more towards the impact that CPA uh, funds have towards the most vulnerable in our community, and that's the homeless population and households who are facing near homelessness. Um, the Somerville Homeless Coalition right now has two programs that are currently benefiting from CPA funds. I know Heidi briefly mentioned them. It's our PASS program as well as our leasing differential program. Um, so the first program provides short-term rental subsidies that support low-income households as they get back onto their feet. And by the end of the enrollment, many of these households have received long-term mobile vouchers, increased their income through employment, or found other ways to sustain their housing. And the second program provides leasing differential that allows formerly homeless and disabled individuals to continue to live here in their community, uh, which is really important because oftentimes their provider network and their community support networks are here within Somerville. Um, so with CP without CPA funding, many of the most vulnerable of our neighbors would not be able to continue to afford to live here in Somerville. So I would really encourage the committee to consider putting more money towards affordable housing um, because the reality is, you know, as beautiful as our community may be with open space and as wonderful as our historic pre preservation may be, we are going to lose a lot of the diversity that makes this community so wonderful if we don't prioritize affordable housing going forward. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Thanks, Priya. Our next speaker is Ellen Schachner. Hi, thank you. It's Ellen Schachter. I live um, at 346 Concord Ave in Cambridge, and I'm the director of the Somerville Office of Housing Stability, and I'm here tonight. Thank you so much for all the great CPA work. I happen to sit on the CPA committee in Cambridge, so I'm pretty familiar with the work that you do, and I'm very grateful. Um, so a couple of things. I first wanted to reiterate some of what Brielle Short and Mark had to say about the need for an increased allocation to affordable housing. I am urging this committee to allocate 65% to take its unallocated version, its unallocated um, portion of funds from the last year and to dedicate that to affordable housing. I did want to say our office, the Office of Housing Stability, has gotten absolutely inundated with intakes for rental assistance. About 90% of those intakes are from non-English speaking persons. And what I am really afraid of is that the, there is now an eviction moratorium in place, but once that eviction moratorium is done, the impact of the COVID crisis is gonna fall predominantly on the immigrant community, on the lowest income communities. We need to have rental assistance that's going to be able to bridge them until they can re-enter the economy. And I think it's gonna be a lot slower for some populations than it is for others to get on their feet again. So I'm urging a 65% allocation so we can give as much as possible, both for permanent housing, but also for all those rental assistance programs that we have been talking about. And I wanted to just mention two other things. One is an issue that has come up repeatedly in that as it is currently understood, CPA, um, CPA monies that go to affordable housing, there's a, a question about whether or not there needs to be a 12-month lease. And I am just encouraging this committee to reach out to their state brethren um, around lobbying that if that is the case, that it's something that should be looked at and relaxed, because in my experience, immigrants, people of color, and non-English speaking people all have much less of a chance of being tenants under lease and generally are tenants under will at will. So it's this huge population right now that is not able to access some of the CPA rental assistance that's available. It's a state issue. I'm just asking you to please reach out and think about um, connecting with your other, with the coalition, the Community Preservation Act coalition around that issue. Um, and the okay. last thing I also, I'm sorry? Yeah. Last item. <laughs> Okay, anyway, um, I, and I just, um, 
the only other thing I did want to support a, some thought about um, restructuring as this goes forward. I know it's the trust fund and not the CPA committee that makes decisions about allocations, but I agree with um, Mark that we want to be really thoughtful about how we provide seamless rental assistance in the most flexible way possible to make it the most useful in this COVID pandemic and going forward, because it's not the pandemic doesn't end for a lot of the families affected unless they get back into the economy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. The next speaker is Cassie Arnau. Hi, everyone. I just want to thank the committee and everyone that's persevering during these weird, um, irregular ways of holding public hearings like this. Um, and um, I want to echo what Ellen and Brielle and Mark and Mary said about the need for affordable housing. And um, I'm a um, I live at 142 Morrison in Somerville. I've lived here for almost 20 years and I'm a housing planner in Cambridge. And I'm also on the board of the um, Somerville Community Corporation. And, you know, this it's more challenging than ever to create and preserve um, existing affordable housing in, in Somerville. And I think the, the crisis that we're facing right now just underscores how much more urgent it is for us to um, continue to find ways to expand affordable housing in the city. And I think it's fantastic that the city has set the goal of 20% affordable housing by 2040. Um, it feels aspirational, but I would love if we could come together and um, make that close to a reality because that really would make a huge difference in our community and in the lives of a lot of people that are struggling right now. So um, I urge that the maximum um, amount goes to affordable housing projects and that when housing projects um, become, you know, before the committee that we we can try to find ways of putting city resources into those because, um, well, I I'm hugely supportive of open space and historic, and I agree with Sarah that there's lots of opportunities where there can be um, combined projects, and I think those are fantastic. Um, housing money actually gets really gets leveraged by the state and federal and private investors. So our city funding um, by investing in affordable housing can can go further um, in in some cases, and if we can invest in those projects, um, we can hopefully keep some families um, that are vulnerable in, in the community. Anyway, I thank you and um, appreciate all your work on this. Thanks. Thanks, Cassie. Uh, the, the next speaker is David Tissell. Hi, everyone. This is David Tissell. I'm a project manager at the Somerville Community Corporation, and I manage the 100 Homes Program. Uh, so I want to thank the uh, CPC for your you know, ongoing support of the program uh, and also advocate along with others for increased funding for housing and uh, affordable housing in general. Um, we have a lot of tenants that are really struggling right now uh, and there's different programs out there. Uh, the local rental assistance programs that are funded through the CPC um, are crucial and I want to echo what others have said that they, they should be expanded right now. And in order to do that, um, we need to allocate more CPA funding for housing. Um, also, um, the 100 Homes Program, which I manage, um, as Heidi mentioned earlier, we have 53 units now that have been funded through the CPA funds, um, which is great. And um, that stream of funding has also allowed us to uh, honor through private mortgages and um, um, also different kinds of subsidies. And we've managed to uh, overall now have 97 units under management. Not all of that has been funded through CPA. There's different other kinds of um, subsidy. But what I'm trying to say is just it's a really important um, source of funding that helps us leverage other kinds of funding to purchase and preserve as permanently affordable um, different units of housing throughout the city integrated into the rest of the city and keep the people there that are there right now and i really appreciate what uh, mary cassesso was talking about earlier in east somerville uh, and we have a lot of tenants over there um, and units and um, we when we buy buildings we um, try to keep everyone there that was there but also in some cases assist tenants with uh, relocating to um housing that fits their their needs so for example we purchased a building 
on Austin Street in East Somerville that um, it was mostly um, immigrants from Central America and many of the uh, families were overcrowded and we assisted some in relocating to other buildings that we own that are permanently affordable and we've been able to then also um, lower the rents for the people that are there so that they can have uh, family yeah, size space for affordable amount. So thank you for your ongoing assistance at 100 Homes and I hope that you continue to support housing. Thanks, David. Uh, we have two more speakers, but I just wanted to uh, quickly remind people that um, there's a, a on the screen there's a Summer Street voting and if uh, we just want to do a, uh, a little exercise here for the folks that are still on the on the call. So pretend you have 10 pom poms to split between four categories. One is affordable housing, two is historic preservation. C, uh, so A, B, C, D. So A is affordable housing, B is historic preservation, C is open space, and D is flexible spending. So you have to put at least one pom pom towards each category and then split the remaining pom poms as you see fit. And then that just helps us um, get feedback from the public as to what your priorities are for this coming year. So um, with that said, I'd like to introduce Robert O'Kelly to speak. Hi. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity. Um, and I'm not really sure why my first name appeared on the screen. I go by my middle name, Kevin. Um, I work at the Somerville Public Library, and I'm also a volunteer with the Somerville Community Land Trust. And <clears throat> I would just like to second what everyone said. Um, who spoke in support of prioritizing affordable housing. Um, working at the Somerville Public Library, I interact a lot with um, lower income uh, Somervillians, uh, particularly immigrants, and the need for afford affordable housing is urgent and dire. And um, I don't need to eat. And if these people are displaced, um, not only would that be just a social injustice, but Somerville would be losing a vital part of its community who give it its diverse character. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, the next speaker and final speaker is Dylan. D I'm Diane. sorry, Diane. 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 Sorry, Diane blew it. sorry, I apologize. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have no voice tonight, but I'm still going to speak. Um, my name is Diane Blewett. I live at 48 Tennyson Street in Somerville. I'm a trustee and a, um, the treasurer of the Somerville Museum. And I just want to ask um, the Museum has been trying to get access for all now to the museum. People cannot enter the museum with wheelchairs or have trouble walking upstairs. So we've been trying to get this project done for a while. We had a major lawsuit against us that um, we lost at more than a year of time and we won the lawsuit. Now we have COVID-19 and the prices for doing construction in Somerville are going up and up. And the museum gives a lot back to the community, to the high school, to all parts of Somerville. And I just hope you will um, consider the museum. But I also want to mention that so many of these other projects are so worthwhile. I can't imagine housing right now for people during COVID-19, not being able to pay their rent, not being able to have food. but. I hope you'll remember the museum because when things get better, and they will, we hope you'll all come to the museum and see our exhibits and then, and learn a little bit about Somerville history. Thank you. Thank you so much. I I, uh, I don't see anybody else in the chat room that uh, has requested to speak. I see a lot of people are voting, so thank you uh, and continue to vote for the next few minutes. Uh, 
uh, if anyone has any questions, also the slide uh, where we'll be accepting, the Community Preservation Committee will be accepting written comments through May 15th. So please um, let other community members know that we're trying to get as much feedback as possible. And also you can email Judith and her, her email address is up there and also share your ideas by taking the community pre preservation survey. And again, the link is listed there as well on the slide. So I think we're done. We don't have any others uh, that have asked to speak in the chat room. So I think I'm gonna um, adjourn this meeting. We also, just to let folks know, our the next meeting we're, we'll be having, the community preservation meeting is our a regular, uh, a regular meeting. It will be another go-to meeting. The public is invited. Um, that's April the 29th at 6.30, but th that is just our regular, our regularly scheduled community preservation meeting. Um, but again, uh, public is always welcome to attend and we'll post a link up on the city website if you would like to join that. So Judith, is there anything that I've left out? This is actually the first meeting I've chaired and the first meeting I've chaired in a go-to. So I apologize if uh, there was a little muting issues initially, but I appreciate everybody's, uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity for you guys to join us and and hope we don't have to do too many more public meetings like this, but um, thank Judith for helping facilitate this and getting all the speakers on board and thank all the speakers for coming as well as the public. Really appreciate it. Great job, Jane, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Jane. You. Can we have, uh, Jane, can we have a, a name back on the motion? Another one second for... So can a member, sorry, uh, can, uh, can I make a motion to end the meeting, Mrs. Laura? Can we have a second? I can second it. Okay. Who moved, who moved the motion? I did, Laura. Laura and uh, Tatiana seconded. Okay, thank you so much. So it's 8.29 and the meeting is adjourned. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jane Thanks. and Judith. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye, thank you. Oh, that's what I press. <clears throat>